need rest? No? <laughs> well, I've got a teenager at home. I, yes, my prayers go out to you. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about resting in the Lord. And we're we'll looking at Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, which says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. Anybody here weary and burdened? And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let us pray. Lord, we just pray that today, as we study your scripture and learn from your word, that it touches us and moves us in a new way. And it moves us closer to you closer in understanding your character, closer in the fact that we want to draw more into your presence. So Lord, right now I just pray that your word pierces our hearts and changes us. And I pray that you use me as your messenger in Jesus' name. Amen. Who do you trust in? Yeah, well, you know, we say that, we trust in the Lord. But then somebody may be watching us and say, really? That person trusts in the Lord? How often do we fall back into trusting in ourselves? You know, our culture brings us, you know, brings men up that way that, you know, just pull up your bootstraps, you know, and get in there and, and fight, you know. It's that we have to do it on our own, that we have to be these people, that we have to do it all on our own, or we are nothing, okay? That's not how God made us. That's not what God had planned for us. God knew that we would be overtaken by burdens, by worries, by cares, by struggles, difficulties. And sometimes we forget that all we have to do is trust in Him. What's that mean? That means the willingness to give it up to Him. That we no longer feel like we have to carry it. We no longer feel like it's our burden, and I want it, and I'm carrying it, and I'm going to hold on to it. And yet, it causes bitterness in our hearts. It causes us to struggle with relationships. You know, God's shoulders are bigger than ours, and he's willing to take those burdens from us. But trusting in him means we have to die to self. Each and every day, we have to die to self. Beatitudes, I spoke about a few months back. I don't know if you remember this one. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's poor in spirit? It means humility. In poor in spirit, it's humility. Coming before the Lord in humility, right? And that's what we're going to talk about. You know, it's probably the rarest gift that we could possibly have. Why do we struggle with this thing called humility? Why is it so difficult? You know, for, even for Jesus' disciples, it was one of the hardest lessons for them to learn. You know, they argued about who's going to sit next to him on the throne. Who's going to have that place of honor? They couldn't get it. And Jesus, in the scripture I just read, said, learn from me. Learn from me. Learn what? To be humble. Meek, lowly, as, as King James Version says, meek and lowly, or gentle and humble in Him. You know, we can, we can uh, counterfeit love, okay? I mean, we can fake it. People do. If you don't believe me, go to Osan Air Base in South Korea and watch the 18 and 19 year old GIs go off the base and fall in love with somebody working in the bar. Okay? Who says that they love 
that person, okay? Love can be counterfeited. Faith, we can counterfeit it. We can fool other people to make it seem like we have faith. Hope. We can fool people to believe in that we have hope. But you know what we can't fool people on? Humility. If somebody has mock humility, it's very, very hard to not see through it. Very difficult. Very difficult to fake it. What about John the Baptist? You think he had any humility? This meek man that was out in the middle of the desert with clothes made of camel's hair, eating locusts and honey, devoting his whole life to being a voice in the desert. He was meek. Who said, I'm not even fit to untie the sandals of the person who's coming behind me. You know, John the Baptist was born of a well-known priest. He could have stood out there saying, you know, he had higher esteem than Jesus who was born into the world. In a lowly, poor family as a carpenter's son, John's born of a priest. His father's a priest. Plus, what's he doing? He's saving hundreds, thousands of people. He could be bragging about, have you ever heard anybody brag about how many people they baptize? I mean, some people do. Some pastors will brag about that. No. When they ask who he is, what do he say? I'm nobody. I'm nobody. I'm not a prophet. Are you a prophet? Are you Elijah? No. I'm nobody. I'm just a voice crying in the desert. Repent. Prepare the way for the one that's coming after me. He must increase. I must decrease. He must increase. And I must decrease. How about yourselves? Are you decreasing? Does that mean you have no value? Well, I'm worthless. That's not at all what it means. Not at all. Because God values each and every person that's here. He loves each and every person that's here. Decreasing means dying to self. Dying to self. When we're decreasing, we're dying to our own self and allowing God to work in us. Living for God and not ourselves. That's what decreasing is about. Taking the focus off me and putting the focus on God. What about people here? Do you, do you get easily offended if somebody doesn't address you by the right title or the right name or doesn't greet you or those type of things or doesn't say hello? Well, that's still, that's focus on self. That's not dying to self. Who said this? Do you know? I am the least of all the disciples. Paul, who wrote more books of the Bible than anybody else. He says, I am the least of all the disciples. But doesn't that contradict our culture today? Isn't this the age of boasting and self-proclamation and living, you know, for myself, how great I am, talking about my achievements and what I've done? This is what really bothers me, is, in a, is if it's good for me, it doesn't matter if somebody else gets hurt in the way. Because it's about me. What's good for me? And I don't know if you hear that out there, but I sure do. If it's good for me, it's okay. It doesn't matter what it, if it might offend or hurt someone else. It's all about promoting self. I thought selfie sticks was a joke. I didn't know they were real. We saw this funny commercial at a conference we were at one time about these selfie sticks and stuff, and we never had seen them before. I thought it was all a joke. I didn't realize that people carry these things around. Well, I mean, Moss could probably put it on one on the end of his cane, right? They probably have attachments for canes so you can use them and just stick them out. Take more pictures of yourself. Yeah. Jesus said, 
He is greater than any man born of a woman about John the Baptist. And what was John the Baptist? Probably one of the meekest, most humble servants of the Lord that lived on the earth. He didn't care about self. He didn't care about self. He came, he was born with an identity, he was born with a destiny, and each one of you here today is born with an identity and born with a destiny to serve God. And that's what he did. Andrew Murray, I've read some of his books about the Holy Spirit, about abiding in Christ. Great author, he's written over 240 books, lived over a century ago. But he said something really interesting I found. He said, I stand amazed at the thought of how little humility is sought after as a distinguishing feature of the discipleship of Jesus. How much proof there is that humility is not esteemed the cardinal virtue, the only root from which the graces can grow. The one indispensable condition of true fellowship with Jesus. Living for self and wondering why you're not being blessed? I think he says it. If you want graces, if you want blessings in your life, you got to die to self and be humble. Not to praise self. You get down, God will lift you up. If you allow him to, you get put down, let God lift you up. The lower we get, the higher God can lift us. Let him do the lifting. We don't need to lift ourselves. Let God do the heavy lifting. Needed him yesterday as we were moving somebody to do some of that lifting. But anyway, <laughs> you know, in the Bible there's many promises. It's interesting just to do a study of some of the promises God has given us. And it's hard to say what the best promise may have been, but I think one of the most precious promises is, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. I'll give you rest. How many times do we need rest? How many times do we feel like we've got to carry this? If we don't carry this burden, nobody will. If we don't carry this low, nobody will. Yeah, somebody will. God will. I don't know if you've ever prayed for God to lift those worries and those burdens from you. But sometimes, once he does, you feel like you can just float. You don't feel this heavy weight pulling you down anymore. God wants to lift those burdens. He wants to give you rest. How can you have rest if you're weary and burdened? It's pretty tough. I think we've seen through Scripture that God has fulfilled at least some of the promises maybe we see in Scripture. But we have to understand that many of the promises that he has in Scripture, there are conditions, okay? Like, if I have cherished sin in my heart, the Lord will not have listened. If you're living in sin and you're relishing living in this sin, and then you're trying to pray to God and wondering why he's not answering you, there's the answer. You can't live and continue your life the same and expect God to answer. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk is blameless. So if you follow the Lord, see the condition? If you follow the Lord, he will not withhold anything. But if you don't follow the Lord, don't expect him to pour blessings upon your life. There's also, also promises that are designed specifically for certain individuals or nations like Israel. This promise here is designed for Abraham. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. That's not for all of us here. That was specifically for Abraham. So sometimes promises are for specific individuals. But there's also promises without conditions. The Advocate, the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and remind you of everything I have said to you. We all can have the Holy Spirit. 
And we all can allow the Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us. But you still have to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, right? Well, does God keep his promises? You know, sometimes we may think at some point in our life maybe he didn't, or maybe he didn't ask for a prayer. He didn't keep the promise that he told us. Well, in Joshua it says, now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God has given you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Every promise that he promised the people, not one has failed. So if you just believe there's certain promises God's fulfilled or and other ones he hasn't, here we see in the word of God that he will fulfill every promise that he has said. He's not a liar. He's perfect. Okay? So he's going to fulfill the promises. But then where do we find our rest? He says he'll give us rest. He promises he'll give us rest. But do we look to him for rest? Or do we look, if only I have enough money, I'll be satisfied. I'll be happy. And then what happens? You have enough money, and you're still not happy. And then you put your trust in something else. Maybe it's pleasure. Maybe it's sin. But when it comes to sin, in the book of Isaiah says, the wicked are like the tossing sea. Well, you know what tossing sea is? That's not very calm, is it? Which cannot rest. So if we're living in sin, it's pretty hard to find rest in the Lord. Pretty difficult. Or maybe we try and find it in worldly things, maybe in possessions. Maybe if I could only get that new truck like Phil has, I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> St. Augustine lived around 400 AD, so it was a bit of a go, but he, he has something interesting to say. Thou hast made us for thyself, meaning God has made us for him. Not for ourselves. God has made us for him. Oh, God in our heart is restless till it rests in thee. There is only one place. If we want peace, there's only one place. And it's not in things. It's not in objects. It's not in other people. It's only in the Lord that we're going to find rest. Yeah. It's a gift. God says he'll give us rest. There's nothing we can do to earn it. We can't buy it. He freely offers it. All we have to do is seek him. Who? Only the people in the second row? Only no, the people right <laughs> only the people that's in the church here today? No. All, everybody, all, everyone. You don't have to be a good person. It's offered to everybody. <laughs> you can come as a saint or you can come as a sinner. It doesn't matter. Just come. Just come. Just come. It doesn't matter if your heart's black, if it's vile, hard hearts. Or even soft hearts. It's open to everybody. First Peter says, casting all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He cares for each and every one of you here today. That's why he offers his free gift of rest in him. The question is, do we believe it? Maybe we do here, but maybe we don't hear. Maybe there's a disconnect that we need to get connected and believe it in our heart. Because we do believe he carries our sins, right? Why don't we believe that he's willing to carry our burdens as well? Cast all your cares. Well, I don't want to trouble him. Well, it's not that big a deal. Cast a few of your cares. Cast one of your cares. That's what it says. It says all. He's open to all. 
And the gift is for all. You want to see a joyful church? See when they cast all their cares upon Jesus. The willing to come before him and cast all their burdens, all their offenses, all their cares, and give it up to him. Do you think carrying that unforgiveness in your heart is what God wants? The offense, the worries. You know, often the time, things that we worry about, we have absolutely no control over. And there doesn't seem to be enough time in the day, so we worry about it all night. Cast them upon Jesus. Give them up. Come before him and give them up. He talks about the yoke. In, in those days, it was a wooden frame that went usually around two oxen, and they would, so they would pull you know, carts and so forth. But in the Old Testament, when they talked about yoke, often it was about the law. You know, the yoke of the law or the yoke of oppression, which was not a very positive analogy. Then Jesus says, it's about to sign you. Come, yoke with me. Learn from me. I will teach you. I will take your burdens. I will help you walk. I will help you. Live his way, and we find rest. We find rest in him. Dwight Moody said, Imagine Jesus saying, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. Come to me for rest. And I don't care how old you are or how young you are. At some point, we, we need that rest in the Lord. We need that rest. And we don't, he says, come as you are. Right? Don't wait. Don't wait until I'm at a point where I think God will accept me. Come. All. No matter where you are in your life, come to Jesus. And he will give you rest. This time we have an invitation. If anybody wants to come up and have prayer, or anybody needs um, to accept Jesus or want to at this time, as we play the video, this is a time for you to come up. And then, or if you just want to sit where you're at, pray or seek the Lord, please do. So, what are the conditions of coming before the Lord? Well, you don't even have to get your butt up. <laughs> you, you can sit right where you're at right now, and you can come before the Lord. Amen. We, we were studying the book of John this morning, in chapter 3, I don't know, chapter 2, chapter 3. It was chapter 3. About where Jesus says he'd tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days, and nobody understood what he's talking about. But you know where our temple is now, where the Lord resides? We don't have to come here. I'm sorry. You know, I like to say you have to come here to meet the Lord, but we don't anymore. God resides in each and every one of us. Here's our temple. We don't have to go to a specific place anymore to seek Him or to worship Him. He's here with us all the time. All He asks is your permission to come and dwell within us. And maybe there's still areas in your heart that you don't want Him access to. And he won't go there unless you say it's all right. He will not violate your free will. Go there. Right now, I'd like to ask Granny T. She has something she'd like to share. Uh, last Sunday, as we were beginning to close, uh, the service, the lights were off, and uh, at that point, I got these, these words started coming to my head, and I quick grabbed my pencil and my paper, and I started writing down stuff, 
because to me that's not, you know, I mean, some, being a songwriter, I, I, I get words coming and I've learned to immediately start writing things. But what the Lord gave me last Sunday was regarding what has been talking about the rising water of the waters. Uh, when he talked about Noah, you know, we are in the ark, we're safe, but my heart was, what about those that did go in? What about our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our neighbors, those around us, even in our churches, who just are not going to get in? And so I, I wrote those words. I was writing in the dark real quickly, and, and uh, the Lord just put on my heart to share this with this body. Uh, so I'm just going to read what, I share, what, what the Lord gave me last week. Uh, waters are rising. Listen up, friends. Today is one day closer to going home. Hey, I don't want to go alone. I want you to come along with me so we can see Jesus face to face and say thank you for all you did. Please don't wait. It may be too late. So ask him to come in your heart and then he'll give you a brand new start. And if after today you're still here, there's nothing that you'll have to fear. He'll help you. He'll help you love that one that's done you bad, the one that made you all so mad. He'll help you get through the night when there seems to be no hope in sight. Don't turn him away, because remember my friend, you may not have another day. He may be gone, gone back home, and then you'll be left alone. We do not want anyone to be left alone. We need to share that with our friends, with our neighbors, with our loved ones. We don't want them to be left alone. So I just want to thank you. Let me share this, what God has given to me for you. Okay, thank you. God bless you. So if you want to become an overcomer, you got to be willing to give up your burdens and cares to Jesus. And if you want your family to be saved, we need to be giving that up to Jesus, and we need to be praying for our family members to be saved. Because as much as we would like to change our hearts, we can't. We can witness, we can tell our testimony, but we can't change their hearts. Only God can change their hearts. Let us pray. Lord, we're just thankful for this message, your word this morning. Lord, we pray that it, it changes us. Because, Lord, you don't ask us to stay in the same spot. You ask us to continue to be moving closer and closer. You're becoming more Christ-like. And so help us in those areas that we need to deal with. Help us in those areas that we need to give up to you so that we can draw closer into your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.